Out of every 100 Americans who pulled a Bible off a shelf today, 55 of them pulled down a King James Version. 19 grabbed a different translation, the New International Version. No other Bible translation even made it into double digits. 55% is a remarkable number in such a crowded market. After 400 plus years, the King James Bible is still the most widely read English Bible translation in the U.S. And I suspect that's also true in English-speaking countries around the world. But 55% is still quite a drop from 100%. And not that many decades ago, that's basically where the King James was. It was the one ring to rule them all. I even remember as a third grader at a little Christian school in the mountains of upstate New York asking my favorite teacher if we could speak in King James English for a day. She said yes, but it never happened. Little kids remember these things. As a senior in high school, I played early English Bible translator William Tyndall in our annual school production. I spoke his stirring words. And many years I shall cause that the boy that driveth the plow shall know more of the scriptures than thou dost. I was burned at the stake in front of hundreds of people for the cause of putting the Bible into English. Thankfully, they strangled me first, but I suffered willingly for the plow boys. But then I actually met some. Working in ministry in college, I ran into some plowboy trouble while using my beloved King James Bible. And the trouble is not what you'd expect. Tyndall's plowboy is our man on the street, the average person. Morning, plowboy. Could you read these verses for me from the King James Version? Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why? As though living in the world are ye subject to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom, and will worship, and humility, and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. What is a show of wisdom in will worship? I don't think I know that. I don't think I do either. And plowboys, we have a problem. There's a sense of mystique, mystery, and archaism about the King James Version. Its older style wording never seemed odd to me. It's such an old English translation that quite a bit of the vocabulary is sometimes misleading. The these and thous in the King James can be learned quickly and easily, I think. If Shakespeare has a character say wit, most of the time, wit just means knowledge. I grew up reading and loving the King James. Welcome to the KJV Quiz Show, the show where we quiz you on things you shouldn't have to know. What did want mean in Psalm 23.1? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Is it wish? Is it pine? Is it lack? Or is it desire? Want is a false friend, a word we still use that meant something different in 1611. Back then, in a context like this, want meant lack. Today, it's more likely to mean desire, as in, Mikey doesn't want to eat the asparagus. Of course, if we need to learn an older variety of English to understand God's words, then that's what we should all do. And the Elizabethan English of the King James Version is not entirely unintelligible, like the ancient poem Beowulf is. <laughs> During my 18 years as a pretty well exclusive reader of the King James Version, I was impatient with anyone who wasn't willing to put forth the effort to get over what I felt was only a very small linguistic hump. I loved the beauty of the King James Version. I still do. And on those rare occasions when I did pick up a translation of the Bible into the current vernacular, my English, it always felt so wrong. This is not the language of God, I thought. I felt then, and I feel now, that having a common standard Bible translation gives real benefits to the church. The King James Version provided that standard for more than three centuries. I sat down with my own pastor, who is something of an expert on the English Puritans of the 1600s, to talk about the things we have lost and are losing as the King James Version's market share threatens to drop further. As a pastor, I wanted to ask you, when do you tell a 53-year-old person who comes to your church, buck up and read these Puritans, it's worth the effort. And when do you look for some kind of modernization, such as they've done for Pilgrim's Progress and perhaps other Puritan literature? When I'm talking with somebody who 
<clears throat> is really in that hungry mode and they want a topic like, for example, John Owen's book on mortification of sin and temptation, um, and they really want to dig into that, just pass them off a Puritan, let them dig. But if they're just now starting, they're just coming into contact with those ideas, then they really need the accessibility. Do you feel like this modern version dumbs down the Bible compared to the King James? I wouldn't say that it dumbs it down. Definitely not. What I do think is that once a person has the instant access, they can lose interest. So having everything instant can lead a person to just kind of slump or feel deflated as though there's no further place to go. So what you want to encourage people is to have the instant accessibility of a modern translation, and then once the understanding is there of the text, then you go on to do the translation comparisons to get deeper uh, knowledge of the text. Welcome back to the show, folks. Next question. What did halt mean in 1 Kings 18.21? And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? Did it mean stop, limp, vacillate, or pause? Halt is a false friend, a word we still use that meant something different in 1611. Back then, in a context like this, halt meant limp. Today, it's more likely to mean stop, as in Nixon's talks with China ground to a halt, or halt, that's my leisure suit. As I entered the most formative period of my adulthood, my college years, I was dead set on keeping the King James Version, even if other people said they struggled with it. I remember arguing the issue with a fellow counselor at a Christian camp the summer after my freshman year. I was nice, but inwardly I sneered at his new international version. I really did. I was sticking with my trusty King James Version study Bible, Black Leather Edition. Given all the benefits of that common standard, wasn't it worth a little effort to understand KJV English? Why were people so intellectually lazy? My experience was very much like that of Howard Long, the Seattle businessman who is ultimately responsible for the new international version. That story started right here in Portland's old Multnomah Hotel. Long was an engineer who loved the Bible, and the Bible he loved was the King James. He also loved to give the gospel to others. And one night he had dinner with another businessman and began speaking to him about the Lord. He asked the man if they could retire to the lobby where Long could read some scripture to him. Long did this, but he couldn't help noticing that the man grew more and more red in the face. Finally, the man burst out laughing. That was the strangest English I ever heard, he said. Howard Long was, of course, frustrated. He went back to Seattle and gave his pastor, Peter DeJong, a wry comment. We've translated the Bible into a couple thousand tongues, Long said, and when we run out of tongues to translate it into, someday we're going to translate it into English. DeJong made a formal request for his denomination to consider putting together a new Bible translation. They wisely ended up working with multiple evangelical groups, and the New International Version was born. The history of the NIV is rooted directly in the need for the plowboy, the man on the street, the man in the hotel lobby, to have God's words in his own English. Though the Bible is insistently foreign and ancient, the cry of Tyndall is that the English in it should not be. Welcome back to the show, guys and gals. Next question. What did commendeth mean in Romans 5.8? But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Was it proves, showcases, demonstrates, or recommends? Back then, in a context like this, commendeth meant showcases, or sets off to advantage, like what happens when you place a disco ball on a black velvet cushion. Today, it's more likely to mean praises or recommends. I had something of a revelation about King James English. I was writing a Bible textbook for eighth graders. My task was to teach them about the funny, interesting, and powerful story of Elijah. And suddenly, after 25 years of being a King James reader, I realized what the King James translators meant when they had Elijah say, how long halt ye between two opinions? What would you say the word halt means? To stop. I always assumed that stopping between two opinions was what they meant. 
But when I read the story in the English Standard Version, I received a key unlocking my lifelong misunderstanding. In the 1 Kings 18 context, where we are told in the King James Version about this idea of halting, as it were, what the King James translators meant by that was limping, which is precisely what the Hebrew says. What? what? This is the Hebrew word used to describe what happened to Mephibosheth when, as a young child, his nurse dropped him, leaving him lame. Elijah's challenge to the people in verse 21 is a picturesque metaphor. The whole phrase, said one writer, describes a mind as wobbly and uncertain as the legs of someone lame. But I missed all of that for 25 years because my Elizabethan English wasn't as good as I always arrogantly, and I mean that, assumed that it was. That day, I stumbled onto the concept of false friends. I had the opportunity to go to New York City to talk to Columbia University professor and linguist extraordinaire John McWhorter about Shakespearean English. What are false friends? False friends is something that happens when you're dealing with two or three languages at a time where you can think you understand because the same root is being used, but it has different meanings in the two languages. That phenomenon of false friends is practically as extreme between Shakespeare's English and ours as between a lot of the words used in French and a lot of the French-derived words that we use in English. And so, for example, if Edmund in King Lear at one point is talking about how he's a generous person, we're thinking that he means magnanimous. But really, within the context, magnanimous doesn't make any sense. And if you're listening to his speech, where he's wondering why people don't like him, when he mentions that he's generous, you think, why would they be measuring this person on the basis of that? The truth is that generous in Shakespeare's time meant noble, not a generous, noble person, but it meant of elevated birth. The idea that generous meant magnanimous is something that happens step by step imperceptibly over time because part of being a noble might be that you're generous with the public. That's what a false friend is, a feature of language that looks familiar but actually isn't. Like when my brother-in-law, as a small kid in Awana, I'm not making this up, memorized So is my shepherd watch on that one. Psalm 23.1 in the King James. He went to his leader in Awana and said, in complete six-year-old seriousness, So is my shepherd, why shall I not want him? Want is a word we still use, but not in the way it's used in the King James Version. It's a false friend. My old professor, Dr. Dan Olinger, was once an editor for a Christian magazine. It was his occasional and usually unenviable task to review unsolicited submissions to that magazine. One submission, however, caught his attention. It was actually quite good. It was a short piece of historical fiction based on the events of Genesis 24, the story of Abraham's servant searching out a bride for Isaac. But there was one oddity that Dan noticed. The author had given Abraham's servant a name, Put, P-U-T, apparently pronounced like the golf stroke. Get it. Put. Dan thought for sure that the Bible had not given the servant a name in Genesis 24. So Dan pulled out his trusty King James Bible, and this is what he read. And note the punctuation and capitalization. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. Put, there he was. The lack of quotation marks and the presence of a capital lettered word in the middle of a sentence both make this mistake a very natural one for modern readers. False friends, in other words, exist in hidden places, not just in words. We see a semicolon and we think we know what it means. We see a capital letter. We see the absence of quotation marks. But all of these features of written language were used differently in 1611. We modern readers, through no fault of our own, simply don't know what we're missing. In your work as a pastor and in Christian ministry, have you run into any interesting experiences with people accidentally misreading the Elizabethan English of the King James Version? There's one in Isaiah chapter, I think it's 43, where um, there was a lady who was a young lady who apparently was wishing that she could find a boyfriend or something, and she was doing her Bible reading in Isaiah 43 and came across this verse. 
Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee and people for thy life. Great. And um, I think that the language of that probably was uh, conducive for her to atomize that. In other words, not really think of it in its context and just immediately apply that inappropriately to her life. Uh, I wouldn't say that's a fault of the King James. No. But um, I think it probably contributed a little. Yeah. Welcome back to the show, everybody out there in TV land. Next question. What did apt mean in 1 Timothy 3.2? A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Did it mean eager, able, inclined, or willing? Apt is a false friend, a word we still use that meant something different in 1611. Back then, in a context like this one, apt meant able. Today, it's more likely to mean inclined to, as in, I am apt to believe anything I say on TV. People take it as a massive affront when someone has the gall of wormwood to suggest that maybe some of the words of Shakespeare might need to be translated for modern audiences. I ate every last piece of broccoli on my plate in school and verily I'll be jiggered if my kid isn't gonna do the same thing. Ralph, would you like some peas? I don't like peas. Oh, that's too bad. And if eating your cultural vegetables is the point of Bible reading, they have a point. But I sort of thought the point was hearing from and understanding the living God. So we need to talk about the reading level of the King James Version. Is it as high as Shakespeare? Is it lower? Numerous defenders of continued use of the King James Version have used computerized tests to prove that the King James Version is plenty readable. Here's one such claim from a book on the topic. Recent evaluation shows the reading level of the King James Bible to be fifth grade as a whole. Many individual passages would be lower. The modern Bibles are shown to be between sixth and ninth grade levels as a whole. The modern versions claim to increase readability when, in reality, they often make readability more difficult. Is the King James Version at a fifth grade reading level? And do computers prove it? I mean, have you ever tried to talk to a computer? Like, maybe the one in your pocket? It can be rather frustrating. Where's the nearest Chick-fil-A? Calling chicks from the USA Incorporated, Las Vegas, Never mind. Nevada. Computers can do super cool stuff, but they can't really understand language. Computers, when it comes down to it, can't read. So what is the computer doing exactly when it spits out a grade level? It's not reading, it's counting. The flesh kincaid analysis you've probably heard about basically assumes that shorter sentences and shorter words are easier to read. It counts the lengths of those sentences and words and spits out a grade level. I shall now show the computer that it doesn't really know what it's doing. If I feed the flesh kincaid analysis a Bible passage from the King James Version, Psalm 1, it will do its math and spit out a grade level. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, etc. But watch what happens when I rearrange the words and punctuation randomly, except that I end on a period so as not to confuse the software. Perish the counsel not ungodly, the Lord leaf ungodly and wither. Of wind shall weigh the day his sinners, Lord, scornful. The he the not weigh is therefore the the in forth like the driveth he so. Grade level, 8.29. Now, I will just rearrange all the same words in alphabetical order. A also, and, 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 R, R, away, be blessed, bringeth but, 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 by chaff congregation, counsel day, delight doeth, doth driveth forth, forth fruit. Uh, same grade level, 8.29. You've heard of anagrams before, like what the rather droll Dave Berry does, rearranging the letters in a famous person's name, uh, like this one. The name of the late Pennsylvania Senator Arlen Specter can be rearranged to spell creep rentals. And here's the key point. Computer reading level tests have no idea whether they're reading the name of a US Senator or the name of an obscure business whose services I hope you all never need. Remember, the computer has no idea what it's reading. It's not reading, it's counting. I once stumbled across a website that tried to use computerized readability tests to prove that the KJV was plenty readable. It said, every new Bible that hits the market attacks the King James Bible with the flat out lie that the KJB is too hard to understand. 
They all claim that the King James Bible is too archaic. You can't understand the Elizabethan language. It's just too difficult. This is the number one reason people lay down their King James Bible. They passed right over the best measure. People, if reading difficulty is the number one reason people set aside the King James Version in favor of modern translations, then perhaps they know better than their computers. In fact, it's a little odd that someone would presume to tell numerous Bible readers, no, you can read the King James just fine, my computer says so. Computers cannot tell us how readable the King James Version is, only people can. Welcome back to the show, Damas and Caballeros. Next question. What did careful mean in Daniel 3.16? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Did it mean attentive, inattentive, worried, or interested? Careful is a false friend, a word we still use that meant something different back in 1611. Back then, in a context like this one, careful meant worried. Today, to not be careful is more likely to mean careless or inattentive, as in, be careful, Bruce Lee might be waiting to attack you because he is still alive. The answer to the first question is yes. God had writers use vernacular Greek and Hebrew when he inspired the Bible. How do we know that the Greek of the New Testament was the language of the man on the street? because of the work of two 19th century archaeologists, Bernard Grenfell and Arthur Hunt. Before their work, Digging in the Sands of Egypt, it was easier to see the Greek of the New Testament as a special dialect of Greek. But once Grenfell and Hunt went poking around in ancient Middle Eastern trash piles, they came to see that New Testament Greek was the same as the Greek they were finding in old diaries, contracts, lease applications, and loan documents. The language of the New Testament was regular common Greek. The very name now used for the Greek of the New Testament is koine, simply meaning common. The New Testament used Greek the way normal people used it, the kind of normal people to whom Paul wrote in the earliest churches. Slaves, be obedient to your masters, he said. And he expected these slaves to understand, not to scratch their heads. And even the hardest New Testament Greek was still recognizably current for its original readers. We have less knowledge of Hebrew, but it too appears to be the language of the people. And now to my second question. Is the King James Version a vernacular translation? No, it isn't. But then, quite obviously, the Elizabethan English of the King James Version is still mostly intelligible to most readers with a little practice. Elizabethan English is not another language the way we usually speak of languages, and yet it's on its way. I think it's helpful to think of our English and their English using the classic Venn diagram. In some portions of the King James Version, the overlap is greater, in others less. But one thing is clear, over time, the circles will move away from each other, as they have been doing for a long time. They will overlap less and less. And this kind of incomplete overlap is something you can see even today, because not every English spoken today is the same. You already know American English, hello, and you know its varieties, like Southern, hey buddy, California surfer, hey man, Brooklyn, hey what you doing, the English of Jamaica and the Caribbean, hey man, you know the various Englishes of the British Isles, hello, hello, hello. You know Australian English, and I might. Americans tend to think of these as different shades of the one English, different accents, but the same language. There are minor variations in vocabulary, such as lorry, loo, and lolly, but the circles are still completely overlapping. But what you may not be aware of is the number of Englishes that don't really make it onto the American cultural radar. Singapore. Hey, hi, how are you? and Kenya. Hello. Both have their own varieties of English, and so does India. Americans hear Raj passed out last week, and they think it means he fainted. If you tell an American, no, in Indian English, that means Raj graduated last week, not that he fainted, I think most Americans would conclude that Indians just don't know English, not that they have an interesting English dialect all their own. It's nearly impossible for us to conceive of an English that is different but not wrong. 
speakers of Indian English return the favor. Asia Boss interviewed some recently and listened to what they said about American English. After I went to the United States, I thought they spoke wrong English, so I made fun of their English. They need to learn English from us. Why can't there be two overlapping but distinct Englishes? The mistakes in other Englishes are so consistent that they turn into not mistakes. Their rules are different but consistent. I mean, do Americans and Brits own English? If all 200 million speakers of Indian English understand one another, what's so wrong with making alveolar stops retroflex and alighting copulas? These Englishes aren't wrong, they're just different. And that's the way it is with Elizabethan English. In many little ways, the language of that long ago and far away people was different from ours. They weren't wrong, and neither are we, just different. And in those areas of difference, little misunderstandings will necessarily grow. How have you seen our church people respond to this change from the King James Version to a contemporary translation? There's great joy in having one-to-one -one communication between you and anybody where it's very clear. Clarity allows you to be able to just immediately soak in whatever's being said and begin to enjoy it. And, um, you know, when you're talking about God speaking to us, the whole point was so that God would give himself to us in those words. He's giving himself to us. If we don't understand it, if it's unintelligible, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, you can't be edified. So I think there's an instant edification that happens uh, that I greatly appreciate. We should ask, along with biblical scholar Glenn Scorgi, if a translation is published but fails to communicate, is it really a translation? Thankfully, we don't have to give up everything we valued in the King James Version in order to gain the readability benefits of newer translations. The best way to honor the translation and revision work of the King James translators is to allow that work to continue. I'll explain what I mean in just a little while. Welcome back to the show, everybody. Next question. What did convenient mean in Ephesians 5.4? Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Did it mean reasonable, appropriate, commodious, or easy? Back then, in a context like this one, convenient meant appropriate. Today it means easy, favorable to one's comfort, as in Ovaltine is a convenient nighttime snack. King James Version is a tradition, and its roots are sunk very, very deep into the soil of English-speaking Christianity. You can't just yank a tree like this out of the ground without doing a lot of collateral damage, and I do not want to do this. I want to steward the trust that people rightly have in the King James Version, but slowly transfer it to contemporary translations. Now, of course, not everyone agrees with me on this point. Some people who love the Bible have very strong objections to what I've said about the contemporary usefulness of the King James Version. Let me respond to three of the strongest objections. Number one, and the most frequent objection I hear. A theologian I highly respect, but with whom I disagree on this point, said, it is better to retain a translation that has influenced culture positively, as has the KJV, than to dumb down a translation to reflect the culture. In other words, we shouldn't lower the Bible to people's level, we should raise them up to it. Maybe English has changed, but it's gotten worse. A lot of people follow up this argument with a supporting one. What are you going to do? Are you going to translate Shakespeare? Actually, I think the whole idea of translating Shakespeare is a great way to understand what I'm aiming for with regard to the King James Version. Let's talk a little bit about that. Part of the reason that people are so resistant to changing Shakespeare at all is, interestingly, related to something about the King James Bible, which is that the language of the King James Bible was already somewhat archaic when it was written. And it has been part of what makes it so that being an Anglophone is to sense 
that earlier stages of the language, even if they're a little bit inaccessible, even if we find them faintly incomprehensible in more spots than we might like, are higher, are better, are to be taken more seriously. Part of that comes from the fact that the most beautiful and most authoritative version of the Bible, even from the beginning, had an antique feeling to it. And then there's also just human beings' natural conservativeness. And so once something is on paper in particular, it looks like that's the way things are supposed to be. And then as the language changes away from what's on paper, we sense it as a departure from something which was supposed to always be. So people have a sense that the King James Bible is the way it's supposed to be. It's not supposed to change partly because of the religious nature of it, but to the extent that everybody understands that it's a translation from something else, there's a sense that if it weren't somewhat remote and if it didn't give you a certain challenge to understanding, that must mean that it doesn't have authority. That's completely understandable, but it also means quite simply that you don't understand. And I think something ought to be done about that. I've heard many people acknowledge that the King James is difficult to read, but they say accuracy trumps readability. And I just want to ask a simple question. Who has a firm right to an opinion on such a topic? That is, who is justified in saying, I know which English Bible translation is the most accurate? What kind of skills, knowledge, and experience do you need to have to make such a determination fairly? You have to know Hebrew the original language of the Old Testament so you can evaluate whether the given translation is sound. You have to know Greek, the original language of the New Testament, so you can evaluate whether the given translation is sound. You have to know English, the language we speak, with a level of technical ability exceeding the average person. And you have to have looked at thousands of examples across the Bible within multiple different translations. You can't just look at one or two. You can't cherry pick the good ones in your favored translation and the bad ones in those you despise. You have to gather a sufficient sample size. I don't see how you could make an accurate, just determination if you don't have these four things. They're pretty well demanded by what a translation is. Let me ask, who in all the world has these skills, this knowledge, and this experience how many people can check off all four boxes? Relatively few. Almost every one of them has a PhD. And this is key. A great number of these people have worked on the modern English Bible translations. So every time someone says, the King James Version is the most accurate English Bible, they're voting against dozens or hundreds of people who have world-class abilities. These people who love and believe the Bible and have dedicated their lives to teaching it to others have all voted for the accuracy of the English Standard Version, the Christian Standard Bible, and other good translations into contemporary English. If I can't check any of those four boxes, I want to make absolutely sure that the people I'm trusting, the people telling me the King James is more accurate, have checked the boxes themselves. I am not saying people can't have opinions, even well-formed opinions, without advanced training. I'm saying that people who haven't done this work ought to realize that they are forming their opinions second or third or tenth hand. There's nothing wrong with that. We all take truth on authority all the time. I believe there's a place called Beijing, even though I've never been there, because reliable people have told me it exists. But second or tenth hand opinions ought to be held with some humility and deference. I think I've shown that the King James is not the most accurate Bible translation into English, not because it's inaccurate, but because it translates God's words into a different English, one we don't speak anymore. A person who finds Shakespeare difficult to understand, when spoken live, and especially if they haven't had a chance to peruse the text beforehand, is not a dummy. We're often told that the reason we find Shakespeare difficult, if we admit that we do, and, and we do, the reason that we find Shakespeare difficult is because we're not British, or because we are numb to poetry, or we're supposed to rise to the challenge with the idea being that it's a challenge that an educated person could be expected to rise to. And all of those things except the British part are true, but the fact is there are playwrights who write in dense language 
who we nevertheless can understand if we've had a cup of coffee. And that's not true with King Lear. That's not true with The Tempest. You sit there and you train yourself not to say so, but sometimes you might as well be at something that's in Icelandic. And the reason is because the language has changed so much, even in just several centuries, that an awful lot of the words Shakespeare uses aren't meaning in his text what they mean to us. And we don't have time to look in a footnote and think about it. This is real speech going on in real time. So you just stub your toe on it. And by the time you stand up, pretty soon you're going to stub your toe again. That's why Shakespeare is difficult. It's not because it's elevated. It's because it's old. I will now reveal to you the strongest objection to my viewpoint on the King James Version. It's this. The readability problem isn't as bad as I'm saying. I mean, a huge number of people and churches and books still use the King James Version. Doesn't that show that it's still perfectly useful for contemporary English speakers? I will answer with a story. The summer after my sophomore year of college, I became a counselor at a large and beautiful Christian camp nestled in the Blue Ridge Mountains. The camp's constituency included a number of churches that preferred to use the King James Version, so to make sure everyone got along, they used only the King James for all preaching, memorizing, and counseling. That camp, like many others, used a team-based point system to motivate campers to compete in various ways. Nearly every single one of the 8,500 plus campers and 100 counselors that summer at this large Christian camp learned the following verse in the King James Version. Psalm 37, 8, Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. I could be wrong, but I believe that close to 10,000 people at my summer camp, including youth pastors and other adults accompanying their church teens, memorized a clause that no one understood. Nobody. Not one camper, not one college student from the many Christian colleges that supplied counselors for this large camp, not one seminary-trained pastor. But in this case, I feel reasonably confident that we asked the kids to memorize something even we couldn't follow. You can look up every word in Psalm 37, 8b, fret not thyself in any wise to do evil, and it won't help. Except perhaps for that odd use of the word wise, you already know all those words anyway. You likely even know that thyself is singular, but that won't do thyself much good in this case. The first half of Psalm 37.8 makes good sense to anyone minimally familiar with Elizabethan English. So my story also suggests that beloved emperors may become naked through a lengthy process and not all at once. I don't think the King James is a naked emperor, but at some point between natty and nude, it's appropriate for a small child in the crowd to wonder out loud where all this is headed. And this has happened. I think of a story told by a faithful lady I've worked with in evangelism many times, Linda. She was listening to a vacation Bible school kid from the other side of the tracks recite a memory verse. Our VBS memory verse this week is from Romans. God commendeth his love toward us. What does commendeth mean? It means shows. Then why doesn't it just say shows? Good question. Ah, those babes and the things that come out of their mouths. Welcome back to the show, dudes and dudettes. Next question. What does remove mean in Proverbs 22, 28? Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. Does it mean move, take away, confiscate, or detach? Remove is a false friend, a word we still use that meant something different back in 1611. Then, in a context like this one, remove meant move. Today it means take away, as in halt. I commend you for carefully removing the couch to make way for a beanbag chair because they are apt to be more convenient. Which Bible translation is best? Sadly, Bible translations have become badges worn by different groups of Christians to distinguish themselves from other groups. This Bible translation tribalism is not healthy. If you don't know what I mean, see if any of these tribal stereotypes some borrowed from another writer, rings true for you. The NIV 2011 is the Bible of the broad swath of centrist evangelicals. The TNIV is the Bible of egalitarian leftist evangelicals. The ESV is the Bible of complementarian reformed evangelicals. The NASB is the Bible of conservative evangelical serious Bible students. 
The King James is the Bible of fundamental independent Baptists. The CSB is the Bible of Southern Baptists. The NLT is the Bible of seeker-sensitive evangelicals. The Net Bible is the Bible of computer nerds. The NRSV and CEB are the Bibles of Protestant mainliners. There's probably a little truth in every one of these somewhat tongue-in-cheek stereotypes. There really are different groups in Christianity and they really do have differences. But the tribalism, the belief that a group's chosen translation is one of many marks of its superiority over other groups, that needs to stop. Bible translation tribalism doesn't begin with a wicked desire to divide God's people. It starts with a simple fact. Translations are complicated things, and very few people have the expertise necessary to thoroughly evaluate them, let alone produce them. So, the Christian consumers whose buying dollars determine which translations are successful are forced to trust experts when deciding which translation is best. I would also say, uh, just to encourage people, that of course, in any given modern English translation, the number of very significant differences is also going to be very, very small. And so if you were to put an NIV out beside an ESV, beside an NRSV, um, you would find, of course, that for the most part, they track along very well with each other. And in fact, that's a very useful thing to do, is to read more than one translation. Because if you don't, in fact, know Hebrew and Greek, the exercise of reading different translations will alert you to where the real points of issue are. And then you can go and read a commentary or go and ask the pastor or whatever for clarification. So I think pressing the need for educated Christian interaction with Scripture, while at the same time being pastorally very sensitive to the capacity, to the educational level of the folks that we're leading, it's a, it's a balancing act, really. It's very important that we care about the people. It's also very important we care about the scriptures, though. And we can't simply turn a blind eye to these issues. One of the campers to whom I taught fret not thyself in any wise to do evil ended up fretting himself to do just that all week at camp. He was one of the most memorable campers I ever had, and not in a good way. The final straw with this boy came at the end of the week when we were just about to find out which team had won the camp competitions. He threatened to wear the opposing team's colors to the final ceremony. My anger bubbled, and when indeed he showed up in red instead of blue, I'm so embarrassed to reveal this, but it's the truth about my own sinful heart, I wrestled him to the ground and started ripping the red button off his shirt. I was as angry as I have ever been. A female counselor pulled us apart and she was shocked. And the boy's face showed he knew just how seriously angry I had been. He said, Mr. Mark, you took it too far. American Christianity, you are taking it too far. Our embarrassment of riches. All these great English Bible translations are supposed to help you, not divide you into warring tribes. The truth is that even if we were stuck with your and my least favorite translation, we would still have an inestimable treasure. We would still have God's words. The KJV translators, in their sadly neglected preface, said the following, We do not deny, nay, we affirm and avow, that the very meanest, that is poorest, translation of the Bible in English set forth by men of our profession containeth the word of God. Nay is the Word of God. The KJV translators were not KJV only. They had no qualms saying that even relatively poor translations don't just contain God's words, but are God's Word. They were not Bible translation tribalists. Perhaps we should all take a page out of their book.